Hello, everyone. Since this is either a highlight, a standalone book, or the first episode in a series, I'm jumping in to remind you what the rules are for this podcast. First rule is no real people stories. That means that any details from our own lives are merely anecdotal. We do not read books about real people, and we are not reading historical fiction. The second rule is that we are basing our analyses off of how the author treats characters and what they put them through. We are not judging the accuracy of the trauma, the accuracy of any actual conditions that may be portrayed, nor the authenticity of a character's reaction to that trauma or that particular condition. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The hosts are not trained professionals, and their opinions come solely from personal experience. In this episode, we discuss fictional depictions of trauma and violence that may not be suitable for all audiences. Please take care of yourselves. Specific content warnings for each episode can be found in the show notes. Events in the media are discussed in approximate order of escalation. This episode contains spoilers. Nicole. And I'm Robin. And on Books That Burn, we are discussing Bridge to Terabithia. Um, I'm going to say it here, and I will say it again at the start of each section. All of our topics are going to spoil the big major event that is probably the only reason you've heard of this book. <laughs> and if, if, if you're someone who hasn't read it. So we're not saying what that is because we're not spoiling it for anybody who doesn't know, but all of our discussions will spoil it. We'll do our best to have the wrap up not. So there's that. Uh, for our factions, we have Leslie, Jesse, Maybelle, Jesse's parents, Leslie's parents, and Miss Edmonds, the music teacher. So Maybelle is Jesse's little sister. Uh, she's six, and she looks up to Jesse and follows him around in that special mix of like earnest endearing and annoying uh because we're we're from Jesse's perspective so so with Maybell yeah. doing that uh after our events of topic um insert spoilers here mhm mm uh there's a moment where so Maybell has been following Jesse the entire book yep She's been trying to be included. She's the little sibling. Um, mm -hmm. They're both still little kids. We have a yeah. six-year-old and a 10-year-old. But Maybelle has spent the entire time trying to be part of Jesse's life and kind of his world. And he has spent pretty much the entire time pushing back at her like, hey, no, I want to hang out with kids my age or my little sibling. I want to hang out with kids outside the family, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And the, gul the gulf between six and 10 is enormous. It's it, that gulf is enormous for a 10 year old. It is not quite as big for a six year old, which is part of the oh, yeah, the yeah. struggle that they have. And uh, after Leslie dies, spoiler here, um, mm -hmm. Maybell asks Jesse if he saw her body, mm -hmm. and so he punches his sibling. <laughs> yep. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about that moment, yeah. And and there's there's a lot of Author wise, narrative wise, the author is centering, even though Maybelle is the one who got who gets punched by her older sibling, Jesse is the one whose pain is still being centered in the moment. There's yeah. no space in this book for Maybelle to react to that. Yeah. We see her cry, but her crying is still about Jesse. <laughs> yeah, and it, it definitely part of why I mentioned like her following him around and like feeling like annoying for most of the book because like we have jesse's perspective so like he has been feeling pestered and bothered and like someone else is trying to intrude into his friendship with leslie for like the entire book and then there's there's no more leslie and maybell intrudes one more time and he he doesn't he doesn't know how to deal with it and the book I don't know, like, it. this is not, 
an excuse, but I feel like the book understands his perspective more than it takes the time to understand Maybell's. They do like, I, I do like the like emotional resolution between the two of them where he starts treating her like a sibling and not like an annoying tiny person following him around. Um, not that that's sometimes not part of being a sibling, but <laughs> he, he starts treating her like a real person, but at the moment where he punches her, he, he's, he's not, he doesn't. It like him hitting her for him isn't even about her. He just needs things to stop to not be like this. And we'll talk about Jesse and the emotions he's trying to process later. But like, yeah, um, as far as we're aware, there isn't other domestic abuse within his family, unless I'm really forgetting something that's in the text. I don't remember any that is on screen, so to speak. Yeah. There's a lot of implication that his father and probably his mother are abusive, but it might not be physically, and it's more just... <clears throat> There's an atmosphere of he probably hasn't been taught to use his words. There, There's also an atmosphere of, like, fundamental Christian in household <laughs> that... Right reads at least to me as this makes sense and like the way his his dad is upset at him for doing things and the way chores are divided like there's a lot of right, like right. this seems like the right environment for that subtext mm -hmm. but there's nothing on screen and i'd argue that you know like the the religious stuff is explicit like you know even like the bit with the church scene. it's more than that it's not it's not the religious stuff it is the way chores are divided up, the way people, yep. the children and mom scramble when dad is coming home. Yep. There's a lot of stuff there. Um, <clears throat> also, he expects his dad to be very angry and like punish him in some way. Mm -hmm. When uh, at the end, after after Leslie dies, he just straight up doesn't do his, his like one chore is milking the cow. And he just straight up doesn't do that like two days in a row. Yeah. And his dad just takes care of it. And he's expecting to be like punished. And instead, he's shown compassion, and he's just kind of like, wow, that's different. Weird. Like, you know, right. he's still a little bit in shock, but he's like, why would why would my father be kind to me? And it just kind of feeds in here. But the, the punch on his little sibling is really the big on-screen thing that we see. Yeah. It, it very much fits in the book, but it, yeah, in terms of the angle, it's very much about the messiness of Jesse's emotional landscape mm -hmm. more than it is about Maybell, who probably has a uh, different, very emotional, messy landscape uh, yeah. from this. On to Leslie and misogyny. Uh, real quick, saying this at the start of each section, we are going to spoil the main big trauma that is probably the reason you've heard of this book if you haven't read it. So just going forward, this discussion will spoil that. You have been warned. Okay, so, like, misogyny is so, like, baked into this p book. The point of a lot of things in it like it's like it's not quite how they meet but it's close like it's it's not how they meet it or no no they met briefly before that it's like yeah. but it, it it very much shapes one of their early interactions yeah yeah i uh, wasn't able to get this book from the library and so wasn't able to do my reread immediately before which was upsetting so anyway um but yeah, there's the, the like, before Leslie shows up in the book, there's this thing where there's these races that the boys, and I do mean just the boys, are doing at lunch at school um, or at recess. They're, you know, they're doing these foot races. And it's like a big deal. And it's like a whole thing. And, you know, being the fastest one, it's like Jesse's ambition and stuff. And then Leslie shows up and they're like, you can't race because you're a girl. And she's like, no, I totally can. And they don't want to let her. Jesse makes them let her race. I believe I have that right. Yeah, he he basically uh, he doesn't make them. He basically uh, 
taunts them for not being willing to compete with a girl. Mm, yes, yes. It, like there's there's a lot of there's a lot of that kind of happening in the book. Not not necessarily with him saying that out loud, but there's a there's a lot in the book of him kind of being like, "What you can't handle this." <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but especially it especially comes out in the foot race. It also is like him being very entertained by her in class because like she has perfected the art of looking like she's doing something productive and daydreaming (laughs) and he knows her well enough to know that that's what's going on but there's also kind of this like a little bit of an undertone of like oh you know well girls may or may not pay attention in school and he's over here like ah, the teacher watches me because i'm supposed to be good at (laughs) that like you know, there, there's just mm-hmm. this undercurrent the entire time. There's the way his family treats Leslie and treats him compared to Leslie and like, assu- like assuming that because it's a guy and a girl who are friends that they're dating or, or whatever, or at least interested in each other and like him just kind of going, ugh, whatever, and, and ignoring it or pushing back against it and telling them that that's wrong. Um there's just this whole patriarchal heteronormativity being pushed at both kids. And like Leslie is described, first of all, I, 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 to, you know, international listeners and just, you know, anyone our age or younger, I don't know if you'd know because it's, it's shifted to feel more like a woman's name recently, but like Leslie historically and still to some degree currently is it's a super gender neutral name definitely was at the time that this book came out like it's used interchangeably for men and women without varying the spelling which you know honestly is refreshing for gender neutral names because often even if the name technically could be gender neutral the neutral version is just using the guy spelling without worrying about it yeah but then there's a woman spelling where it's like oh you wouldn't give that to a whatever and i you know i'm someone who got the guy spelling of their name from the jump and i you know i'm very happy with it i quite like it but they're anyway a whole thing with names like this it 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 it, it, with how like she's described with like her hair shorter than a boy's and basically a description that's like she wears a tank top and jeans. They didn't use the term tank top, but it, that's what this description is. They described it as a as a, an undershirt, and there's like yeah, there's a connotation there that it's a guy's undershirt from like when this book was written. Mm, mm, good point. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so it, there's it, it, it's it's interest. So it's funny because. The IE ending to names has been very feminized recently. Mm-hmm. And so when I, because I hadn't read this book before, I kind of, I when I started out, I was like, what do you mean? That's not gender neutral. Then I was like, oh yeah, this book has been out for how many years? Um, yep. But yeah, there's there's a lot of this. You know what I find interesting? It's had its 40th anniversary edition come out. So, oh, wow. you know. You know, what yeah. I, you know what I find interesting? Yes. Well, no, not till you tell me. There's one moment in the book where we had almost made, we had almost had a, a different topic for this section, full disclosure, because mm-hmm. we, we had almost made this a topic about homophobia because there's a single redacted throwaway line and we were going to try and make that a whole topic. And I'm glad we didn't. But what I want to point out with misogyny with that, mm-hmm. there's one moment where Jess's dad is like, you like art, you could be gay. Oh no. Mm-hmm. But Leslie is over here being, for the time especially, incredibly androgynous. Mm-hmm. At no point is that charge leveled at her. There is an assumption that she will be feminine eventually, or that she could be at any moment. Like, there, there's this, there's nobody freaking out that she is too masculine. There are people who are like, oh, you're doing feminine, you're doing feminine wrong. But like, Nobody is going, oh, no, you're trying to be masculine. Like, that doesn't happen on pages. Right. And But I thought, uh, yeah. It, but it's also, like, yeah, that homophobia intertwined with misogyny because Jesse, like, likes art. And his dad's like, oh, no, do you want to sleep with guys? Like, like, yeah, and and Leslie is, like, short haircut, literally dressing in basically yeah. guys' clothes or as close as she can get to it. His mom is like, does she even own dresses? But it's not. It's not. She's trying to pretend to be a boy. It's 
does she own dresses? Like, but it's also part of different. misogyny where like oh, nothing it is. she. But I'm, well, I'm I want to I want to say this particular way. <laughs> well, yeah, but this particular form of misogyny is that like there's n- because she's so socially stuck in girl, 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 girl. There's nothing that she can do. Oh yeah, short of, out of that. coming out as trans or something, which would not have probably not have happened in this environment when the book came out like this isn't that story but like nothing short of hey people i'm literally not a girl there's nothing any and even that might not be enough for people to stop treating her like a girl and this isn't that she's not a girl but that the the threshold for what she has to do to escape girldom if that's what she was trying to do there's so much room where like she's still in it whether or not stuck in it is in the right term, she's still in it for so much more leeway than Jesse has. And this, like, neither side of that is good. Like, these are both bad. Well, it, it feels like what it is is that there is such a narrow list of things that make you quote unquote masculine in this mm-hmm. setting that Jess very easily can just fall off of that. Right. In an mm-hmm. instant, he can just quit checking all the boxes. But one of those boxes is his your actual physical body being like cis normative. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so it doesn't matter. It it it, do- it doesn't matter what she does. Leslie will never check that box and so she'll never cross that threshold. Right. Whereas Jess fit checks that box, but he can fall off of that threshold at any moment by just enjoying the wrong thing like it's it's that masculinity has such as this narrow definition right that you know everything else is considered considered feminine in this context and it's it's just a it's just a wild juxtaposition there because the 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 mild hint there i say mild because it's not explicit like it's lit there's a liter- there's no slur used there's no nothing explicit said there's a literally a sentence where the character in their narration redacts whatever word it was his dad used. Um, Mm -hmm. But that's, that's it. We get that before we meet Leslie. Yep. And so I read, I was reading this because I, again, I, this is the first time I've read this and I was expecting that like once, once we saw Leslie and she was canonically described as this being like incredibly androgynous individual that Jess has to like figure out that she's a girl literally his mm-hmm. words i was expecting her to be the one who gets pushback for the rest of the book and it nope. never happened because she doesn't check the biological box that everybody is looking for and so it doesn't matter what she does she'll never she'll never even pretend to cross that threshold in this context which is a particularly ridiculous thing like i know i know what you mean but like it's it's just it's, it's wild. such a, it's absurd it's a particularly ridiculous yeah. thing when we're talking about like prepubescent kids <laughs> for to yeah. say that she's not going to check this biological box and it's like yeah, yeah they're they're, <laughs> they're anticipating that later she will fit the whatever and so they're making her now act like it but like they don't they're not even making her do it they're assuming it'll happen eventually that so they don't have to make her do anything because it'll right, just right. be a thing oh yeah yeah and like um you know worrying that she won't have a dress but like, you know, Jess says she has lots of dresses and his mom goes, oh, OK, <laughs> like, like, oh, of course she does. All right. I just needed reassurance. Like, OK, you know, as long as she has one, everything will be fine. And um, like, we'll talk about this a bit more with the survivor's guilt. But like after after Leslie dies, the way Je- with the way like the adults react around Jesse, it's like they're acting like his girlfriend died. And so it, it's this, we'll talk about how it's like, you know, this mix of like, it's them trying to give emotional care, but not understanding what emotional care he needs, because that's not what their relationship was. Um, yeah, there's there's but, a lot of like, buddy, I understand this happens sometimes, like, you know, this happens like, to couples all the time. Like, it's, mm-hmm. it's, I mean, that that line is not explicitly said, but that's the like, the undertone of all of the care that he received. Like, for example... He never gets care from his mom. Yeah. It's always his mom pushing him toward his dad because his dad as the man in the relationship would be the one to relate, even though his mom is still alive. And it's like, actually, 
maybe it should be both of you, especially because considering that his dad is not the one providing parenting and care, the rest of mm-hmm. everything. But there's this there's this expectation that it is a male female relationship. So when Leslie dies, his dad has to be the one to to provide that care. Like it's, right, because it's the relationship of crush I'm getting to know dying versus best friend possibly probably first real friend yeah dying those are two totally different things they can have overlap but in terms of how they're getting treated it's two totally different things and i think that a lot of the adults reaching to act like not like i mean they're they're preteens so not necessarily like they were literally dating but like treating it like Oh thank goodness he likes a girl maybe he's not gay. Like that <laughs> yeah. that line is nowhere in the book, but the adults reactions have a lot of that feeling where it's like as long as he's around a girl he could fall for like enough, yeah. maybe like the art won't infect him or something. Um Yeah. Yeah. So, uh it's I mean I I just I I love Leslie and <laughs> I I just her as a description it's like you know not not that every character i relate super hard to has to be trans or non-binary but like like she's been one of these i like just as a book especially with how long this book has been around like her her character has been one where Mm -hmm. like generations of queer people have seen themselves in her which makes it cut especially hard when she's the one who dies yeah we'll talk about that in our wrap-up yeah but yeah i'm mentioning it here just in case it, it's hard to figure out a way to talk about it without spoiling that she dies <laughs> but yeah that's that's a that's a thing and you know because like i you know really liked this book when i was little and you know I know, Nicole, you didn't have that experience because you literally read it for the first time yesterday. But yeah, um, I also would not have gravitated toward this book at any yeah. point in my life, middle school included. Just nothing wrong with the book. It's just that's not it's just not your thing. Not my thing. I'm the one who stuck it on the list. <laughs> <laughs> on to Jesse and Survivor's Guilt. And briefly going to say as i said in the other sections we are going to spoil the big traumatic event that this book is famous for if you don't want that spoiled please go straight to the wrap up okay <clears throat> so jesse um survivor's guilt because leslie died and he's still here and dealing with this like at age 10 like he just yeah um okay so they've been whole book they've been going to this they've they've been going across this creek for this you know fantasy thing terabithia that is the emotional core of like like the first part of the book like the bulk of it it's like kids being friends and going to this place and and stuff but it involves crossing this creek and they've been swinging across on a rope um and like in the kind of mythology of their story that they're making up, like if you just go any other way to get across, then you're not in Terabithia. Like you have to swing across the rope in order to get in. Jesse goes with the music teacher to the art museum um, instead of going with Leslie to Terabithia. And it's a rainy day. Leslie goes without him. And she drowns. I believe, she, I don't remember if she slipped or if the rope snapped, but either way, she, she ends up in the water. The The parents hypothesized that the rope snapped. Yeah. But also, I don't think they knew what it looked like beforehand, so... Possible they were just like, oh, this rope obviously snapped. Who would go on the rope as it is? Like, yeah, we don't know. Yeah, we don't actually know. But the the, the adults think the rope yeah. snapped. And, and she drowns. And so he, like, you know, goes to this goes to this art museum with like this person he has a kid crush on and then comes back and and his best friend is dead and he just he doesn't believe anybody for like a day he's like no he he like he's in denial for at least 24 maybe 36 hours and like his little siblings are actually kind of mean about it (laughs) 
because yep. he gets up the next day and is handed breakfast and he eats breakfast, ignoring everybody, not talking to everybody, kind of just in shock. And yep. his little sister is over here like, well, clearly you didn't even care about her at all because you can still eat food. And he's literally sitting there going, wow, I haven't eaten in 24 hours. I really shouldn't have done that. Did you need me to naughty? Like, <laughs> yeah, just... Like, am I not allowed to eat until she's alive again? Like, is that how this right. works? Like, <laughs> right. Like, he, he, it's not a very long moment, but he does have a moment where he's just kind of like, what? But I haven't eaten. <laughs> I haven't uh-huh. eaten at all. <laughs> and like, yeah, it's, there's no real understanding. Well, I mean, to be fair, I think he is the oldest. So uh, nope, he's the middle one. Is he the middle one? It's his younger sibling that reacts, though. Yeah. Now he's the middle of five. Yeah. But it's just, yeah. It, it, there's a lot of just like he has that moment of denial or that very long day and a half of denial he gets incredibly angry at her for leaving him <laughs> by dying mm-hmm. uh, that happens at like three separate internal monologue moments um he just he is so frustrated that he is left so to speak all alone in this town that was terrible until she showed up and he had a friend and he's just it, it's just not he does not do a good job of processing even by the end of the book and then he, there's this whole like him trying to get closure with her parents but then her parents move because they only were out living there for her somehow quote unquote i don't know how that works but uh they were the it was the we're rich from the city but we want our kid to have a country experience thing but they don't oh so not because she wanted it but because they wanted it for her yes okay gotcha yeah so there's that moment and then like he's you know trying to like talk to her parents and then they're leave it like there's just a lot of of him just feeling abandoned and left behind and stuck. Who ends up with the dog? They, Was it her? Parents, his, uh, her yeah. parents do. Yeah. Her dad cannot handle losing her dog yeah. to him. I'm like, ah, uh, dogs don't live forever either. The dad's in for a rough time in like a decade. Oh no, I just had that thought. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, that dog is like less than six months old, so. Yeah. It'll be a while, but still. Um, oh, sorry. I just, I mean, this is, you know, the book doesn't go this far, but the dog's probably going to outlive Leslie, like, age-wise. Mm, um, yeah. If it has, like, a normal dog life. Yeah. Anyway. Sorry, just envisioning the, like, sad, sad sequel <laughs> that follows Leslie's dad. Um, oh, no. No. No one wants this, and as far as I'm aware, I'm glad it's not written, but, like, gosh. Anyway, yeah, so with with Jesse, he, before he left, he had this moment where he was, like, glad he didn't invite Leslie because he wanted to go with his art teacher to this thing. Like, he, he wanted this event to be what it was. And then afterward, he has this, like, anger and guilt like if he'd gone with her she wouldn't have drowned how dare she leave him by dying um part of why he didn't believe she's dead is because you know she was such a strong swimmer like why would that have happened like i don't know how he would have vouched for her being a strong swimmer or something before this i well i mean they they were in the creek a couple of different times just playing in the water before like Right, right. But like, you know, that's very different from p- pounding rainstorm, swollen creek. Right. But also this is him coming back and just being told she drowned and him going, what? <laughs> no, she's not. My best friend can't be gone. <laughs> like, Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's just the shape of his denial. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely just denial. Yeah. It's, it's, he's just in shock and denial for a while and struggling. Yeah. Yeah, so in terms of, because we, we've, we've talked a lot about um, the interactions of various characters with each other, and in terms of the having it be Jesse's perspective on this, mm-hmm. when it's a story about Leslie dying, I mean, there is the very practical consideration that it's, uh, a, a, when it's a story about the suddenness of her death that really doesn't work if the book had been following her um 
So there's that. But it also means that um, the first part of the book is very different from the last part. Yeah. Because, I mean, part, part of why, you know, we have this warning at the start of each of these sections is to like to let you know, hey, there's a really, really big trauma with this book that is either the only reason that you know about it, or it's going to shock you partway through if you end up picking this up at random. And you know, we're doing our part not to spoil it for anybody who doesn't want to be spoiled by like not having death be the name of this section, for example. But it it does mean that if you don't know that this is a book where a kid dies, you're in for a real emotional whiplash. And this this is one where if a friend wants a book recommendation, I will spoil this book when I recommend it to them. <laughs> I'm just not involuntarily re- large spoiling it for all of our audience. But if I'm going to rem- recommend this book to someone, I'm recommending it as the book where this kid's best friend dies and he has to grapple with those emotions because that's what this is that's what everything's like heading toward even if they don't know it because part of the point is that they don't know hi i'm matt aka storm again and i'm the host of cpov autographs at certainpov.com it is a bi-weekly interview series where i interview folks from all over the arts from writers to comedians to magicians to musicians even actors, historians, podcasters, pretty much anyone who's willing to chat with me for a little bit. If you like interesting conversations with even more interesting people, go to certainpov.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, music is life and life is good. On to the wrap up and ratings. Uh, really quick, this book is famous for one particular uh, traumatic thing that happens. We are not going to spoil that in here. Just, I have said my spoilery thoughts that maybe could have gone in the wrap up. I've put, we've put those in the section discussing survivor's guilt. So if you want that, that's where that is. Okay. For domestic abuse, I'd say the specific event we talked about is either moderate or severe. I think it's, moderate yeah it's not a pattern of it i mean and even the the actual description we get is like literally nothing (laughs) we get it happened Mm -hmm. victim cry done yep basically yep cool yeah mild or sorry moderate works for that then misogyny it's either moderate or severe i think it's Um, actually pretty severe it's sure. framed yeah. it's framed like the author is treating it as a more moderate thing but in a modern context oh oh yes as modern readers it's pretty severe oh yeah okay nope that that makes sense it's it's pretty explicit <laughs> which makes it very and it's explicit and pervasive makes sense survivor's guilt uh definitely severe yeah it's yeah yeah um Integral, interchangeable, or irrelevant? I domestic feel, abuse. I feel like the domestic abuse, like the particular main event that we discussed. I think it's irrelevant. Yeah, at best it's interchangeable. Best being, if things going to be in there, we want it to matter to the plot as a general bias that I at least have. I don't think this does. Yeah, and it, it does not. Um, everything else about their relationship could have proceeded unchanged without that event happening. And I don't even think uh, the event does anything. Like, it literally does. It's just right. a thing. Um, yeah. Misogyny. Uh, integral. I think it's actually interchangeable. Ooh, okay. All right. No, it doesn't actually do anything plot wise. It's just, it's literally just background noise for the story. Oh, gosh, yeah. I mean, it's background noise that affects most aspects of Leslie's life. But yeah, Jesse's the point of view character. Yeah, it doesn't actually do anything for Jess. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I agree, but I don't like it. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, survivor's guilt. Integral. Okay, this is better be. This is kind of like the point of the book. But I like, so. I think this might even be our first book like this. 
but I mm. like that we have one of each in order. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we have irrelevant, interchangeable, integral. Yeah. So that's cool. I mean, we'd worried that we were talking about like the thing that happens first in the book as our... Oh, that wasn't a worry. It was just funny. It was amusing to me. Okay. They were talking first in about the thing that's like almost last in the book. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, no, that's right. I think that is the first time we have one of each and they're in order. Mm hmm. Because we're unlikely to have them in order in the other direction. That would mean that probably. That would mean I think we did it wrong. <laughs> yeah, that would that would mean we did it wrong because we try to have the most severe thing be the last topic, either severe or pervasive, some combination of, of that um, as our last topic in the episode. For trauma treated with care, um, I don't think I don't think care is what's going on with the minimal description for the domestic abuse. No, I, I think it's not being treated as worthy of time. Yeah, or pages. Yeah, I'm just gonna put like, no. It's yeah, also just, just no. It's also not a very visceral anything, but yeah, uh, misogyny. No. <laughs> No, it's not. It's 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 not. I'm gonna go ahead and say survivor's guilt also no. Yeah, uh definitely no. Um, because additionally the survivor's guilt is tangled up with something where it doesn't expect the reader to know that a thing is gonna happen either. So Yeah, there's no there's no care for the reader or character of any kind, um in any way. Yeah. Yep. Well, that that was fast. <laughs> For the point nice of view. <laughs> yep. Yes. Yep. Hey, it's just um, Jess forever. It's just Jess. Yep. And like aftermath, it's it's all Jess. Uh yeah. We have one point of view character here who is also kind of the narrator, but not really. It's odd. Yeah. Uh we have a new section. We are replacing the um, inspiring author tip with a new topic, a new a new thing. Uh, it's called Trope Spotter. This is the first one we're recording with this change. It won't necessarily be the first one released. And so you might have heard this thing before saying, hey, we're doing a different thing for this section. Trope Spotter is where we talk briefly about a trope in the book as a trope. And we're going to pick ones that don't spoil the book. Yeah. But in this one, the trope spotter, we have mistaken for gay, wherein <laughs> Jesse likes art and his parents are worried that that means he's gay. Uh, as far as we are aware, he's not. As far as the book is aware. I mean, he has, he has a couple he has a couple of pretty explicit hetero mm -hmm. crushes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, he's not gay. Like, you know adult jesse comes and says hey i'm bi i'll be like okay cool but right. like nah he 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 likes girls yeah but the the and we we talked about this in our misogyny section a bit but yeah. like the homophobia of oh no likes art must mean he likes boys we are concerned for our cis heteronormativity that that that's in there um yep so I mean, mistaken for gay is right what it says on the tin. It's where someone is uh, not gay. This could also be like not queer. And people are worried that they might be for reasons that have nothing to do with anything they've said or done with regards to actual attraction. Or if they're, you know, ace or something, lack of attraction, um, potentially. Um, but yeah, where. Anyway, that's what that trope is. And it's in here. All right. For our favorite, our, each of us are going to have our own favorite non-traumatic thing about the book. Um, hmm. I like their dog. Mm-hmm. The dog is fun. I like the fact that the dog was a Christmas present. Mm-hmm. Because Jess panicked and go went, oh, no, I'm given a dollar for every person in my family, but I've never had a best friend before and I don't have a dollar for my best friend. And then saw a sign that says free puppies and went, aha, I'm going to get a living creature, which, and don't do that to people, by the way. Don't give you people don't. living creatures. No surprise pets. Never, ever, ever. 
But in the book, it was very funny. Mm-hmm. It, it was very funny 10-year-old logic. Yep. Uh, yeah. No, don't don't surprise people with pets. Because <laughs> in order to not spend money because he didn't have it, Jesse made Leslie's family have to spend money on a dog. They have the money, so it was fine. But like, yeah, don't don't do that to people. But yes, it's fun in in the book. Um, my favorite non traumatic thing about the book, I the foot racing scene. Come on, like <laughs> the yeah. I I I really liked the foot races. I kind of in rereading it, I didn't remember if the foot races like came back later or something. And I you know I liked I liked the foot racing. I wanted the foot racing to have like a bigger presence in the book than it did but i enjoyed the section where it's there yeah so uh that's it for bridge terabithia please let us know what we think about trope spotter um we uh we're using our terms and definitions for the different tropes from a website called tv tropes it's one that we both love and have read a lot of over the years and you've noticed probably if you've listened to many of our episodes um, us using various trope terms. I'm fond of pointing out when there's a MacGuffin. So hopefully trope spotter as a segment will keep us going there for a very long time. But yeah, thank you so much for joining us and we'll catch you in a fortnight. All music used in this podcast was created by Nicole as Heartbeat Art Co. and is used with permission. Our transcriptionist is Heather. Follow her on Twitter at MamaDragon20. We're proud members of the Certain Point of View Network. Find all the CPOV shows at www.certainpov.com. You can contact us on Twitter at Books That Burn or by email at Books That Burn at Yahoo.com. Please consider leaving us a tip at Kofi.com slash Books That Burn or becoming a monthly supporter on Patreon.com slash books that burn all patrons get access to our upcoming book list bonus content including the second half of all interviews and will receive a one-time shout out to get updates on our written reviews recent episodes and newly completed transcripts subscribe to our fortnightly newsletter at buttondown.email slash books that burn you can find us on apple Podcasts, pandora spotify or wherever you get your podcasts please leave us a review wherever you're listening this helps people to find the show thanks for listening we'll be back in two weeks